Yes. Uh, hello, me. Um, yeah, I think it's time to start. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh, at first, I I introduce Ming Jin, and uh, today we're very happy to invite Ming Jin from Monas University, and he works on graph neural network and chem series uh, analysis, and also large language model. And we all know the chem series; it's a very important uh, uh, modality uh, for finance, for EMT, yeah. human behavior understanding. So it's very important. And uh, and also large language models are hot. So uh, Ming uh, Ming tried to uh, link the time series and large language model together and uh, use the reprogramming um, method try to put them together to uh, integrate uh, large language model to process time series data sets. So uh, next time we can now we can move to Ming for uh, the presentation. Hello, Ming. Yes, and uh, very appreciate for the Dr. Yu's invitations to host for today's session. And in today's session, I will introduce our recent work accepted by the iClear this year. And it was time LRM uh, by reprogramming the large language model for time series forecasting. And my name is Ming Jin, and uh, I'm a final year and graduating PhD student from the Monash University. And my research is mainly about the general time series analysis, uh, graph neural network, and the multimodal learning. So um, let's get it started. And oh, yeah. by the way, oh, this yeah. work, uh, yes. And this work was uh, a very great uh, collaboration with the Ant Group and the IBM Research and other institutes across the world. And uh, before we get started, uh, let me briefly give the outline for today's session. So we break them into three parts. So in part one, uh, I will give a very brief introduction of the whole thing that we need to know, like the time series and language modeling, as well as the concept of the model reprogramming. And uh, on this, I mean, in the second part, uh, I will mainly discuss our method. Uh, that's the time IRM. And in the last part, I will um, uh, highlight some very interesting related work that worth to read. And I will also provide a very brief prospect of our visions for the uh, language models for time series analysis. And uh, let's begin from the first part. So in the first part of the mention, I will uh, introduce what is the time series for those people who are not familiar in the field and the language modeling. And also I will give a brief, very brief introduction of the multimodal large language models and how it's like and what we can learn from them. And at the meanwhile, I will uh, give a hint of the large language models for time series data. I've read really a very interesting concept recently that is the model reprogramming. Okay, so uh, time series, right? So conceptually time series is the sequence of data points that occur in a successive order over some periods of time. So it's a recording uh, from the census and it's a high precision numerical values. And in real world, uh, for example, you know, in the highway, there was some sensor, right? And uh, for example, the vehicle speed. So that could be one of the uh, time series uh, recorded in this system. And in practice, uh, we, I mean, for the standard time series, we have, we, you know, in practice, we have two types, the univariate time series and the multivariate time series. Okay, so imagine that the green line, for example, in this case, that represents the vehicle speed. Uh, that's the universe scenario, right? But in multivariate scenarios, imagine that the blue line could be something that's, I mean, integrated into this system, like the engine oil temperature, right? Like with the increasing of the vehicle speed, the engine uh, oil temperature will increase at both. So that's the multivariate scenario. And then the language modeling. So uh, conceptually, uh, language modeling is to let the machine to understand our human language, or we say the natural language, but how we can do that? Um, here is a very uh, uh, naive examples to illustrate the, the idea behind. So imagine there is a language model that it, it expects the textual input. So the textual input could be something like, I saw a cat. So those are kind of, uh, examples of the textual input. And then after the 
uh, the language modeling, we could have the, the textual output, right? So in this example of the web search engine, the text, uh, the textual output could be the predictions of that's what you might like, like on the chair or running after dog or something like that. So that's the predictions of the model. And uh, for, la uh, for, for language models, because uh, till the recent days, most of them are still like open source. So in that case, we still can obtain the numerical reputations of the tokens that's useful for other downstream tasks and systems. So that is the very brief picture of the language modeling. And if we dig a little bit deep, we could say that the objective here is that we're trying to design a kind of neural network, right? So we use the neural networks to process the context. So the context could be some previous history, right? And based on that, we have a kind of prediction hat here, and then we want to get the probability distribution for the next token. So that's a very typical scenarios in the language model, and that's like, if the context could be like uh, I saw cat on uh, uh, then we want to predict this the next token. So we want to actually to estimate this kind of conditional distribution in this system. All right. And in this case, imagine that we have uh training examples like I saw a cat on a mat. Anyway, so if the context could be like the I saw uh, then the cat, something that I want to predict. No matter what's the skip grab model or continue bag of model that one, that I'm going to use, anyway, my objective here is trying to uh, predict or maximize this condition uh, probability that cat and I on the context of the I saw. So this is the the optimal ob objective in uh, the very beginning of the language modeling. Obviously, in a big picture of the language modeling. Okay, and here is the roots map. You know, nowadays, because nowadays we normally talk about the large language models, but what are large language models, right? So conceptually, that's a, a, a language model in larger scales, but what is it? So here is the root map. Like we introduced the Ingram models, right? So that's a very specific task helper. So it could be some um, Grammarly characters in email writing, right? If you use uh, Gmail or something, when you type, uh, when you give a typo, the system are trying to correct that automatically, right? So that's a specific task helper. And then we have the uh, the neural language models like what to act, something like that. And then we have pre-trained language models like BERT, that's very famous encoder only model, right? And then nowadays we have a more general purpose, the task solver. So as you can see, that the task solving capacity is increasing, okay? and for the uh, large language models, we expect that because nowadays, you know, in most of cases, we try to treat that as kind of agent, or we say the, the CPUs of a, of a workflow is trying to coordinate the information and to achieve the general purpose, the task solving uh, capabilities. So that's the large language model. So it has some emerging abilities like the in-context learning chain of sort, et cetera. And, um, um, give a very remarkable achievement in recent years. All right, so um, so that's the uh the things. Oh, by the way, here is an, another you know background related to the LLM. So like uh, uh, we see that you know for most of the existing uh, I would discuss the open source uh large language models like P five Falcon, uh Llama, as well as GPT three. So as you can see, most of the training data are actually from the web pages. So that contain a lot of diverse informations collected on the on, on the website, as well as there were some uh, uh, portions of the conversion uh, conversation data, book news, scientific data, as well as code. So no matter what kind of the conversation, we just find that time series may be involved, but in small amount. Most of the the crops here are still uh, based on the modality of the nature languages. So. Uh, in this case, we may ask a question like how we can activate the time series capabilities of a large language models in a system. So that is the question we are going to figure out. And here is the, the architectures of the large language models. So uh, as mentioned, um, we, you know, at the very beginning, we have the encoder-only models, right? Like BERT. And then we have the uh, 
encoder decoder uh, models. And by using that, we could do some, we could very, uh, we could build a system that's very uh, uh, handful for some tasks like the, the nature translation, right? Like it can use the encoder to better understand the source language and to transform that into a hidden representation, right? And based on that, we can use the decoder to generate the the target language that that um, maintain the same semantic meanings here. So that's the encoded decoder only uh, decoder models. And recently, most of the large language model are actually based on the decoder only architectures because it's mainly focused on the generation task, but based on the prompts. So the prompt could be the combining of the task instructions without the contextual information. Okay, so for the decoders, uh, they were casual decoders, prefix decoders, but the key difference is like the attention mask, like uh, this one is the unidirectional attention mask, right? But the prefix decoders, I mean, on the on the pre uh, prefix part, it's a low the bidirectional uh, attention mask. That's the technical difference. But anyway, the uh, most of the large uh, language models recently, they are actually built on the decoder only architectures. And in this article, we also use uh, Llama. So Llama is also based on these uh, architectures. And let's say, uh, I mean, in the part two, I would, I would discuss like how we can activate the Llama's uh, capability for the time series forecasting. All right, and then uh, we know a little bit about the uh, the large language models. Now we uh, we talk about the multimodal uh, large language models. So uh, LLM, you know, uh, it's they were natively designed for this new kind of uh, language models, right? So they're natively designed for processing the the textual input and give you the textual output. But recently, we see a rapid development of the multimodal LLMs. Okay, like uh, you know, imagine that our world is not only the language; the it's very vivid, right? It contains other information, like the image, like the audio, videos. And so far, we know that there were at least there were like uh, uh, there there were at least one solution existing to do that. For example, the next GPT, right? It can well handle these three modalities. Like we can give the instructions, we can give the images, and I can allow the system to generate those uh, videos that's related to this topic or this image. So that's possible. But the question is like how time series analyze can benefit, uh, can benefit from the recent advance of the time series, oh, sorry, of the large language models, right? Like uh, this data modality is still the missing puzzles in the whole, I mean, in the whole, um, in the whole part of the development, like how we can let the multimodal LLMs to incorporate the modality of the time series that's still an open questions, and uh, we also see that there were many recent works are trying to answer this question. Okay, so but anyway, this is also the the key topic for today's session, and. In this visions, um, we recently gave a uh, uh, given review like how uh, language or other foundation models can be used to uh, to do the general analysis of the time series data and the spatial temporal data. So time series data is what we introduced, right? And for the spatial temporal data, because you combine them together, that's uh, consists of the most part of the temporal data we see in the physical world and spatial temporal data it could be like the spatial temporal graphs and it could be the temporal knowledge graphs as well as the videos so they were a common uh, spatial temporal data and based on those um data modalities we can train a foundation model or we can repurpose a specific uh, for example large language models for specific tasks like forecasting, classification, imputation, et cetera, right? Like anomaly detection. And of course, we could also like to use whatever fine tuning or, re or reprogramming to benefit a lot, a series of domain specific applications like climate monitoring, clinic question answering. So in this case, we also see that there were some works related to that. 
um, a still deal with one made by Google, and they are trying to analyze, for example, I give the 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 ECG or EEG of the patient, and I also tell the uh, LRM with the patient's context that could be like uh, 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 the history of the diagnosis and the patient's questions, and then the system could based on the e based on the time series readings like ECGs to answer some basic questions uh, to the patients, like the 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 like the GPs, right? So uh, that's clinic QA and. Uh, we also could do the urban computing and we're at the video reasoning. So um, they're all possible. And in today's sessions, we care more about this branch. That's the uh, large language models for time series data. So uh, uh, in this context, we actually have two branches, right? Like for the general purpose analyze or domain specific applications. And for the general purpose analyze, we could do uh, general forecastings. Right, like what we're going to introduce. Uh, uh, that is the time. Uh, uh, there were also other works to, uh, to do, uh, this direction, like the one fit all, uh, prompt cast, tempo, uh, test, etc. So there were there were a bunch of the methods in this, um, uh, in this branch, and for other tasks, uh, like to support, uh, for example, time series classification, imputation, and other tasks, there were also some of them. And for domain specific applications, uh, like what I just mentioned, like the NYU train, uh, as well as the Gato train. So they were they were doing the clinic uh, related cases. And of course, there were also some uh, application related to the financial something because those are, uh, those domains are typically, I would say, usually involve the time series data. And this is very critical to, to solve uh, the puzzle of the time series analyze with the large language models, right? Like to like what we just mentioned to complete the the puzzles of the multi model uh, uh, learning in the real world. So uh, if you want to uh, learn more about the I mean the background things, you could have a look of this survey. And uh, now let's move to the background of the uh, time RLM. So in this work, we're actually using a technology called the model reprogramming. But compared to the model reprogramming, uh, we may be very familiar with the with these three concepts, right? So the first one is the uh, task specific learning. So like imagine that you uh, you are trying to design a forecasting model and you are provided with a specific data set. So you may want to do some, for example, manual uh, pre-processing, uh, visualization, etc. things, and you build the model on that data set to solve a specific forecasting task. So that's the task specific learning. And um, on top of that, recently we we'll, we are also uh, having some works related to the transfer learning in time series. Like we we train the models, for example, the traffic models in the San Francisco, but we are typically like uh, considering like a uh, for example, if we have a lot of data in the San Francisco, but we have less data in Melbourne, we would say that can we transfer the knowledge in the traffic models from San Francisco to the, the traffic system in the Melbourne? So that's the tra the transfer learning, right? And in most the cases, they're all considering the in-domain knowledge transfer, but there were also some like cross-domain transfer. So uh, that's also possible. So that's one um, direction to do, to do that. And uh, again, on top of that, we have the foundation model recently, right? Like, uh, uh, no matter in the, uh, you know, in in, in computer vision, um, and other as well as other domains, we see a rapid development of the foundation model, even for the time series. Recently, like recently, we see that, uh, no matter the Amazon, uh, Google, as well as other, uh, company, they did, um. We say they released some time series foundation models for specific tasks like forecasting, etc. So that's possible, but it emphasizes strong uh, data collections. Like you typically need a large scale time series data for the model training, and that's the pain point in the in the field. Like in most of the cases, our public data set remains in the small scales, and their training data is actually. Uh, collecting from um, their uh, 
applications, uh, their application cases and not open source yet. So that's the pain point of, uh, of developing the foundation models for the time series. So uh, based on these um, situations, we consider another possibility that we, can we just uh, activate, or we say reprogram the, the large language model? Because we, the common sense is that we believe large language model can obtain a diverse, or we say a universal knowledge from a massive amount of the training data. So we have that assumptions, and based on that, we could we just think, uh, we just think like, can we activate the inherent capability of the large language model to solve the time series task? And in this paper, we just find that's possible. Okay, and for model reprogramming, the key idea is, uh, the first step is usually like we need to de design a kind of input transformation layer. For example, if your model is about the, the language, the kind of language model, then you need to bridge the modality gap, right? Because your input is not in natural language and you need to let the model to understand what you are saying. And the output of the, for example, the model, the source model may not your desired output. So at this stage, you also need the output mapping layer. So that's the typical pipeline of the model reprogramming. And in the following, I'll, I will show you like how we can actually, we can simply achieve this goal in using the RM for time series forecasting. Okay, and here is uh, um, if, if an example together with a table to summarize some related works, but um, due to time reason, we're not uh, discuss too much details here. And if you have questions, you can ask after the session and I'm waiting to, to answer here. Okay, uh, let's move to the second part. Okay, so the uh, time IRM. So in this part, I will first discuss our motivation, like what motivated us to design this model including the conceptual designs. And then I will talk about the model architectures together with some highlights. And finally, I will uh, summarize our main results, like our findings and our evaluations. And then uh, let's begin. So firstly, uh, our uh, the motivation, right? So our motivation is in twofold. So firstly, we believe that the reprogramming can make the large language models instantly ready for time series uh, tasks. So uh, to achieve this, we need some adaptation, right? So um, our idea uh, as depicted in this picture is that we keep the pre-trained large language model intact and we only incorporate the trainable reprogrammer here and to achieve certain alignments. But how to achieve this alignment? Sorry, this alignment should be um, should be the things we, we were trying to think about. And in this paper, we have this formula uh, established that we are trying to appro approximate the perfect reprogramming with two steps, the adaptation together with the alignment. Okay, so uh, adaptation here is actually to make the large language models to understand how to process the input time series, uh, time series data. So this is what I'm saying to breaking the domain isolation, right? And based on this, we are thinking about another layer of the motivation. That's how we can re to, to reprogram the RLMs to make it as a powerful time series analyzer. Okay, so uh, in this case, uh, we consider another layer of alignment here that to further eliminate the domain boundaries. But how? So in this case, we are considering to using the the, uh, the prompt. So we treat the prompt as a kind of prefix, and then together with the reprogramming layers, we call it the time series patch reprogramming. We combine them together, and we just find it can achieve a very good reprogramming result to make the intact we say the frozen large language models to do very strong time series analyze, especially in the forecasting scenario. Okay, so that's our motivations. And here is the illustration of the reprogramming large language models. That's the part C. Uh, in comparison of the task specific learning, this is what we just introduced and the model fine tuning. So this is, this is more common for 
the pre-trained time series models or in many of the, re the recent so-called foundation models. So uh, the part A is quite easy to be understand, right? Like uh, most uh, time series forecasting models are actually, uh, are actually task specific learners, I would say. So for example, they could do traffic prediction, they could do the, uh, the energy, uh, the energy forecasting, and they could also do other kind of tasks, but you just need to design, or we say to, to train a specific models to do to achieve that. And for the uh, part B, uh, the key idea here is like to we can we use a large scale source data samples to train a foundation model here, and then for our uh, specific source task, we tune the model head and to achieve that. So for different source tasks, we have different adaptations uh, need to be done. So, I mean, in the typical way. And, um, but this also puts another uh, hypothesis here, like we need to have a large scale of the, uh, the training data, but in time series um, until uh, today, it's still really difficult to collect that amount, but the huge amount of the uh, the data samples for a successful foundation model training. Okay, so uh, here that's why we consider this scenario the the cross modality adaptation. So that's the part C. So uh, the key idea here is to transfer the knowledge from powerful pre-trained source foundation models, and in our case, it's the large language models to perform target tasks like different forecasting tasks here with the model fine tuning or reprogramming, and we choose to. Uh, achieve that with a very simple but effective reprogramming. So that's what we are trying to do here. And okay, so here is the architecture of our proposal. So um, uh, to make a one sentence summary, so our work is trying to combine two parts together to make a significantly better forecast. So the part one, is the prompt. So the prompt contains domain expert knowledge together with the task in instructions as well as other information in the nature language. Okay. And another part is the reprogrammed input time series. So you may ask that, okay, so the you come you're trying to combine different modalities. The short answer is yes, but after the reprogramming, the input time series will be transformed into the source representation space that is the the language representation space so after that we unify these two different modalities in a single um representation space and then based on that we we put into the lrm to do the reasoning and we've just find it can it's really effective to activate the um to to activate the lrm to do task related uh reasoning so uh, in other words, to unlock the LRM's ability for time series. So that's possible. And uh, as we mentioned, there were two uh, there were two key parts, right? So the first part is the adaptation, like you need to make the entire workflow to work at least, right? So that's one, two, and five. So that means by removing three and four, the entire system can still work, but compromise the, pro uh, the, the model performance, right? So because there were no alignment that being done. So uh, the key parts, uh, three and four. So three is for the patch reprogramming. So uh, this is the first key aspect of our work. Like we are trying to reprogram the time series patch embeddings into the source data representation space. Like in short, we're trying to use the word embeddings. We use word embeddings to generate text prototypes. And we use those top, uh, text prototypes to reprogram the input time series patches. Okay, so that's the key idea of the patch reprogramming. And the second part, so this one, so this blue uh, prefix, so that's called the prompt as prefix. So this uh, technique is to use the nature language based prompt to act as the prefix to enrich the input context and guide the transformation of the reprogrammed time series patches. So in um, in other words, so this part uh, plays the role of the activation, like to activate the LRM to better understand the yellow part, like how 
I need to transform these parts of the representations for a successful um, task uh, con conducting. So that's the key idea of the promptized prefix. So combine these two key aspects together, we have our model like this. So uh, here is an example to uh, illustrate the idea of the patch reprogramming. Okay, so uh, of course, like we are trying to do the cross modality adaptation. So we have the source uh, source modality and uh, the target modality. So the so so our source modality in this case is the word embeddings, retrain the word embeddings from the larger language models, and our target modality the time series patches, like and uh, inspired from the image captioning, like for a specific image, we human can always use like a few of sentence to describe the key information in that image, right? But for time series, it's it's usually difficult, like for us to to accurately to 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 uh, describe the information in that time series. But it doesn't mean it's impossible. So. The key idea is like for different patch of the time series, I believe that there should be some way for us like to use the natural language to do such, or we say to do similar captioning. So for example, if the the time series in patch five, given the trends of like uh, steady down first, uh, sorry, uh, like shut up first, then steady down. Then we can actually to represent this time series patch with these two text prototypes, the uh, the green one and the purple one, right? And to learn the green and purple text prototypes, we need to do the mapping from the raw vocabularies, from the large language models, and that represents different word embeddings. So in this way, um. We actually want wish to uh, establish two different mappings and to achieve this. So that's the basic idea of the patch reprogramming, and it, it actually reflects the things of the uh, time series captioning. And then uh, we move to the uh, uh, the prompted prefix. So conceptually, we could do both, like um, in the left. It would in a generative manner that we use the patch information. We could use the patch, uh, reprogram the patches as the prefix, and then followed by um, the language based uh, prompt to give the forecasting. But there were, there were at least uh, there were two technical challenges. The one is how we can achieve the high precision tokenization to tokenize the high precision floating numbers. Especially for our like, if we want to do the long term forecasting, there will be a large site of the uh, high precision members. But how we can do the effective tokenization? That could be a question. And the second part is the contextual window, because if we want to do the long term forecasting, our forecast could larger than um one hundred and twenty. So that's a lot of numbers. So how we can uh, adjust those technical challenges that remains a question for us to implement the things in a generative manner, but it doesn't mean that's impossible. Okay. And um, there were also another uh, uh, prior knowledge that in the context of time series forecasting, we usually see that the predict in a predictive manner like this that can yield by the performance compared with the generative things so that's why like recently there were there were lots of the transformer based forecasting models are trying to operate in the mode of the in a predictive manner so that's in another layer of the reasons like why we are trying to give the prompt as prefix compared to this like uh, the patch as prefix so prompt as prefix it actually proposed to enrich the input context. So like given the time series, we could provide some contextual information here to guide the transformation of this yellow part, the reprogrammed time series patches. And uh, this PAP is actually more desired in time series forecasting as for the reason that I mentioned compared to the patch as prefix 
uh, like this. Okay, so that's why we do this and our motivation to do this as well. And in this example, we provide uh, prompt templates, like how we can design the, the PAP part. So in this case, for example, if we want to forecast uh, the electricity transformer temperature. So here at the very beginning, I will give a background information to the LLM, like what what the case uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to solve. Uh, this part is important in short, together with the domain knowledge. Because imagine that you are trying to do the traffic uh, forecasting. Because in the traffic domain, we human knows there were some uh prior knowledge is like uh we could see that the traffic in the highway could be uh could be bad, like especially during the, the rush hours, right? So that's a type of the domain knowledge uh we're trying to give the machines to help it better understand the context. But for the traditional forecasting model, the you you actually cannot find an explicit way to to provide the model with those uh information right so that's one of the benefits like uh, we that's why one of the benefits we can use the LLM to to do a more in context forecasting okay so that's the first part and second part we give the task instruction so that's quite normal right and then uh we have some uh statistics to be provided and uh, this part is Actually, if not mandatory, but uh, what we want to see here is that in practice, there were much more possibilities here, like in bringing time series and the related textual context together. So you can imagine there were lots of combinations and lots of possibilities here in different applications. We may have different uh, prompt templates. That's possible. And that's pretty much all about uh, the time IRM. So the methodology is very simple. And here, uh, uh, well, and here are some uh, uh, experiment result. So in this case, this is the standalone term forecasting result. And uh, our result is summarizing the first column here. And here is the takeaways. So in short, we have an average performance gain of over 12% and 20% compared to the GPT-4TS. That's also known as the one fit all model. As we're at the time snap. So that's a strong model in those common uh, time series forecasting benchmarks. And sorry, and this table uh, represents the short term time series forecasting readout on the M4. So that's it also the standard protocol, which is the, the, the usually use the benchmarks for the short term. Uh, forecasting evaluations and in, and we see that compared to the GPT for TS, we out outperform the by around uh, nine percent. And whereas in uh, some cases, our result is even better than the in heat. So that's very remarkable because this is a very strong um, classic models in in the M M four computations. And here is the result of the few short learnings on both 10% of training data and we're at the 5% of training data. And in general, we also see a lot of uh, improvements compared to whatever the GPT-4TS, D-Linear, Patch TST, and we're at TimesNet. So uh, here's the statistic summary, so I will not read, uh, read them and I will leave uh, uh, it for the readers to, uh, to, to have a look after the sessions. And here is the result for the future of learning of 5% training data. Uh, and you could see that uh, similar trains holds here and we're even compared with uh, GPT-4TS and we have the patch TST. Okay, and table five, uh, this part gives the zero short learning result. Right? And I believe this is the things that most people cares about. Like uh, uh, when I did, for example, a successful reprogramming on, for example, ETTH1, that my model can be like directly used on other similar um, scenarios, like uh, for example, uh, ETDM2 for for the minute level data on another uh, on another on another site. So the short answer is yes. Our model also supports uh, a very good differential learning capabilities, and as you can see that it consistently outperforms the most competitive baselines by large margins. Okay, like uh, it's over forty percent, and <clears throat> Here's the um the overall 
comparisons, and you can find more details uh, in the paper's appendix. And ablation, right? So ablation, if, if important, like we usually see some interesting clues here, like first part, A1 to A4. Um, the things we want to demonstrate here is that reprogramming will not violate the scaling law properties provided in OEC embedding in most of the modern large language models. Like if we train on a llama 7 billion, that if that has the default uh, layers of 32, uh, we have this performance and we see that it's better than the llama model that we use only like the first eight layers. And anyway, you could also experiment on the llama 2, for example, uh, uh, 7 billions or whatever. So the scaling law actually remains retained here after the reprogramming. So this will not change the properties of the RLMs. And that's good because we can expect that the models to uh to to remain work across different language models. The methodologies or we say the frameworks remains workable even on, for example, GPT-2 or even more uh, advanced models like uh, uh, Lama 270 billions that also works depending on the hardware um, situations on each of the persons. So that's the first part. And the second part is the cross-modality alignment, right? Because as I mentioned, we have two key aspects. The one is the patch reprogramming. Another one is the prompt prefix. And we find that if whatever, I mean, um, which part uh, you, you disable will harm the model performance, whatever the patch reprogramming or prompt prefix. So that's uh, is the things we are expected. Okay. And then the, uh, the oh, sorry, I forgot to mention the C1 to C3. So this part is related to the components in the, uh, in the prompt, uh, in the prompt template. Like we have, uh, for example, we have data set contacts, right? Like we have domain knowledge and we also have task instructions or something of that. So here we provide a very brief um, ablation uh, result of like uh, if we disable each of them, what the result will be. So um, in practice, and as I mentioned, uh, we believe there could be more possibilities and this is just for your information. And then the efficiency. So uh, in short, what we are trying to demonstrate here is that the model reprogramming, this tactic will not overburden the RLM. So for example, if the uh the inference time for for a, for a large language model is for example either at the specific level, model programming will not increase this bar significantly, but in contrast, it will hold most you know almost the same inference level. I mean the 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 cost level, so it will not overburden the large language models. So this is what we're trying to demonstrate here in table sip. And here we also compared with uh, the QLORA, so the parameter efficient fine tuning. And our takeaway conclusion is that it's favorable. Model reprogramming is favorable, even compared to the parameter efficient fine tuning in this context in time series analyze. So uh, that's our main result. And this part is, a very interesting visualization. Okay, so here we're trying to uh, investigate whether patch reprogramming can do what we expect it to do. So uh, in the first A to D, in the first top four subplot, we are trying to visualize the optimization of the reprogramming space from the randomly initialized to well optimized. So at the very beginnings, the model don't know like which word embedding should I use to reprogram the input time series. But after the optimization, we could find that this is really sparse and only a small set of the prototypes, that's the different columns here, participated in reprogramming the input patches. So each of the row gonna be different input time series patches in this experiment. And we find it is indeed sparse. So that's it, what we expected, right? Because we believe that there were only a small amount of the, the related uh, context-related 
text prototypes that we can use to caption live the time series patches. So that's the things. And indeed, we can see it here. And at the bottom here, we did another set of experiment that we select three set of the words from the RLM's vocabulary. So word set one that's mostly related to the time series captioning. So it really, it's some words like periodics, seasonal increase. So imagine that you, you naturally can use this word to increase, or sorry, to describe the trend of a time series. Imagine that time series as the image, you can use this word to describe them. And word set two, that's some of them related to the time series captioning, like quantile, average, short, et cetera. And word set three, that's, that's make no sense. Like uh, here, it's totally irrelevant. So it, it, it's not correlated to the time series at all. It's like, uh, it's some word like outspoken, garly, uh, analog, et cetera. So ideally, we expect that word set one, those words are actively, are actively involved in the prototype forming like this. So this heat map is more active than this one, right? So that's what we expect. Let's demonstrate that the Patriot programming indeed can use the, can choose the correct word embeddings to captionize the, the time series patches we provided. So that's the visualization we provided. Um, yes, so that's pretty much about the time RLM. So it's very simple and it's very effective in adapting the frozen large language models for time series forecasting. And uh, it actually can outperform many uh, specialized expert model, but uh, the highlight here is we only use the outdated uh, and the smallest Llama model due to the hardware constraints. That's the Llama 7 billions. And if you use a stronger RRMs, we expect, as we mentioned, the scaling law re remains hold here, and we expect a better performance, much better performance here. And um, and here we also uh, have a very interesting insight that the time series forecasting as well as other uh, task can actually be cast as yet another language task that can be tackled by off the shift large language models to simply achieve or match the solar performance. So that forms a very interesting insight for the follow up works. And lastly, I don't, I don't mentioned because for the bigger picture, that's the multimodal augmented time series forecasting or even multimodal augmented time series analyzing. So we are the first to achieve this aspect, but we believe there, there, is, a, there is a room that we can do more. So, so we can do more, yes. So uh, that's pretty much for the part two. And now let's move to the part three. So here I will highlight some related work that, that I think they that, that I think they are uh, well worth to read. And I will also provide a brief prospect of what we think about the uh, large, length, uh, large language models uh, for time series in the future. Okay, so the first related work uh, I mentioned is the uh, GPT for TS. So that forms an important baseline mind field in our methods uh, for comparison. And GPT for TS, uh, the architecture is very simple and very straightforward. So given the input time series, you do the patching, like uh, what we did in the patch TST, right? And then we put into the GPT-2 model. And here we only tune um, the alien layer norm layers in the GPT-2. And then we, um, we forward the uh, embeddings to a specific task head for different tasks. And their results demonstrate that even for the GPT-2, they can achieve a very strong performance in lots of the time series tasks, like forecasting, different type of forecasting, and time series imputation, anomaly detection, and even classification. So it's demonstrated that it's possible for us to use the language models to do time series things. And this work, uh, LRM time, so this work has been published in uh, the NIPS uh, conference last year, and this work is uh, is even more straightforward. Like 
it's using uh, uh, out of sheaf large language models and without any training here. It's just inputs the time series into that model and to get the forecasting. So here they were introduced some, uh, they were introduced to some uh, uh, specific tokenization strategies and, uh, sorry, like this. So they find that for different language models, different tokenizations may have significant impact. So this is the challenge that I just mentioned. So we don't know like what kind of tokenizations are suitable for specific language models. So that's the challenge, but they, their experiment uh, proved that with a specific um, crafting, we can actually achieve a very good uh, performance by simply inference the large language models with the input time series without even any trainings. Like here is the air passengers uh, forecasting. You can see that the the predicted results actually follow the trend well. And uh, as we add for these cases. So anyway, both of these baselines demonstrate uh, one thing that the large language model can indeed help uh, in solving the time series uh, problems, and that's feasible. Um, the next question is like how we can we can do more with this. So here is our uh, prospect. So although that we have witnessed a great success of the pre-trained model in NLP and CV, right? And I mentioned like limited progress has been made for powerful general time series an analyze. There remains a limited progress and. I would say this is the burgeoning field. And the question here is like, can we just simply prompting a reprogrammed large language model to perform various general time series and analyze? So uh, like what we depict here, that the first step we, uh, we extend the concept of the model reprogramming here, like we crafted the model model instruction data for the model tuning. And then we use the specific reprogramming here. We use that to do the instruction tuning and optimize on different pretext tasks here. And then we have our reprogrammed tuned models established here. And then we design different in-context learning queries. For example, the first one is for time series forecasting and the second one is for time series classifications. And with some hints, with some I mean, the index examples here, we could, uh, can we just successfully prompt this model to do diverse tasks? Like it, we can let it to do the effective forecast. We can also like by just, uh, by, by something prompted to do the successful classification. So that's what we think, um, what's going to be happened in the field of the time series analyze, uh, maybe in, the mid or late this year. So again, uh, the next GPT, right? So by connecting the LLMs with the multimodal adapters and the diffusion decoder, so that's the generation part, right? So it's possible for us to achieve the universal multimodal understanding, or we say the multimodal switching, right? So this idea is actually uh, can be fully explored on time series data, right? Like imagine that you plug uh, a time series encoder here and we're at the time series generation here, even though we still not have too much of them, we can make the entire workflow to work as well. So there were two use cases, like the one we can do the forecast and mention, and then we can do the, uh, do the classification with the reasons, like explained, uh, explainable classifications. So that's possible. And uh, here is the use case in NextGPT and the type reason I cannot to discuss too much details here. And all right, so uh, that's pretty much. And uh, here is, uh, here's like, like back to our perspective. And we believe that like RM empowered time series agent could be the next, um, next topic, I would say after the exploration of the RRM for whatever time series forecasting uh, or other kind of tasks because they are still in the 
in the area of the LRM centric predictors. But what next? So that could be the LRM empowered agent. Okay, so um, that's all for today's session. And thank you so much. Like, uh, if you uh, are interested in this work, uh, you could find our papers in this QR code. And our code has also been made uh, public. And uh, you could access the code on GitHub with this QR code. And thank you so much, guys. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> thank you, Ming. Yeah, it's a great, excellent uh, job. And the next section, we will go to the question and answer. So, uh, can you see? Uh, can you see the chat? There is a, a question from Smell, Yasni. Ming, can okay, you see yeah, the chat? Okay. Yeah, yeah, actually I can see. So indeed, the patch side is actually one of the, the hyperparameters in the model design. So um, so far in this work, you have to tune that like based on, I mean, tune that in a, uh, in a task specific manners. And you are right. So if there were many fluctuations, your patch size should be relatively small like to reflect to always say to tokenize that time series correctly, right? So because there were many voice saying that the, the patching is actually a kind of tokenization in time series data. And yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, are there some yeah. other questions you can unmute and to the direct user uh, speech to talk with the mean? And um, are there some person? Yeah, uh, if if no person, I have some question about it. It's a it's a great work, so I have to hear. And uh, I also do some time series things about e e g e m g and like the kind of things and body uh, skeleton data set. Yeah. So I have a question about uh, uh, for the data set you have a uh, reprogrammer for train a specific model to link uh, the language to a time series, right? So it means you have a data set uh, with the time, uh, time series and also related uh, text uh, uh, description, right? Do you have? Yes. Yeah, so, so like this. So it means, uh, do you think it's a big challenge, for example, like EEG and uh, EMG date? Because a human, it's hard, to, it's hard to describe for human to describe it because they up and down yeah. with a very big uh, frequency. Are there some solution for it uh, from your side? Yeah. So in short, I think the healthcare area, like what you mentioned, the, the EG or ECGs, yeah. it's a very good application area for this kind of technique. Why? Because imagine that's how the GP make the, make the diagnosis for a patient. That's the GPs will read them. The, the historical diagnosis of that patient. So that will be some information in nature language, right? So like uh, some record in the computer store. So the GP will refer to that kind of record and then the GP will have a look of your, your recent EEG or ECG readings combined with them. So actually, in fact, that you can see that the recordings are in nature language and EEG or ECG, they were time series, right? So. Combining with them together, you can naturally fit them into a framework like the time LLM. But depending on what you are trying to do, because time LLM is actually doing the forecasting. But if you but if you don't want to do the forecasting, actually you may wish to refer to like to this kind of visions here, like uh, to enable a, a diverse kind of the downstream task, like uh, the diagnosis. Very, uh, whether the patient has the, the aerial fibrillations or normal EC or, or, e, or EGC or ECG, sorry. So, uh, that's one of the use cases, but you could also like use the time, um, to simply do the forecast. That's also possible, but I don't think in this, in, in this application area, the forecasting is the case because we normally don't want to do the forecast. We want to do the classification and by simply modify the, the task ahead, I believe that there should be a way to. Uh, to simply achieve it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. 
cool. Uh, are there some other questions? And you can ask. Uh, uh, no. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, great work. Uh, it's very, very, very interesting merging uh, LLMs with time series data, as it's uh, very complicated to what you have succeeded to do it. So congratulations and thank you so much for this uh, great presentation. Uh, I have just a question regarding the data preparation, because it's not a question, but uh, just to clarify uh, ambiguity I have. Uh, so, like, uh, as it's a multivariate data set, so, uh, like, uh, like those patches, they contain few rows of data. And those uh, patches that, uh, like, that preserve local semantic information, we use them, uh, uh, we embed them, like, through that uh, pre-trained uh, model, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, does the, the patches, like, they contain each patch, for example, contain normally, like, few rows of data, uh, that refer, for example, to the source data set that contains all those words, right? Mm. So, in my vision, I think uh, the key benefit for using the large language model is their emerging abilities. As I mentioned, one of them could be a very strong reasoning capability, but how you can activate that, that's the question. So in your case, as you mentioned, there was some metadata metadata here uh, that's in that's in nature language, right? So if in if it's this case, you can simply like refer to the framework we made we 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 introduced the here, like for example, the time um, it's naturally accepts the language based the semantic information as to treat that as the the, the the domain knowledge of or something like that to treat that as a prefix of the whole things and then followed by your time series data, then you can use the LLM to do the transformation of those time series embeddings to do specific tasks. So in short, natively time LLM do the forecasting, but by changing the um the decoder part, or we say the task ahead, you can actually let it to do other other kind of tasks. So based on your need, that's it what we, uh, what I can tell about your use case. So I'm, I'm not sure whether that's answer your question. Uh, great. Yeah. Uh, it answers like uh, the first part. The second part is about uh, for time LLM, like, uh, I, uh, it could be great if you can just summarize like in a few sentences the data preparation like from the input channel into like passing the embedding to the to the uh, freezed model. Okay. So this is a very so a good question. So I need to back to the framework. Yeah. All right. So let's have a look at this. So firstly, uh, sorry, one moment. Okay, so firstly, most of the time series data, especially for those public time series data, they don't have the very rich metadata available, right? So that's why we introduced this part, the input statistics, right? Because we want to enrich the context. But in some use case, such as the what we discussed, the healthcare, they have rich metadata available. So in that case, you could treat that as the domain part, as the domain knowledge part. So you naturally incorporate that into the into the prompt for each batch of the data samples. So in, you attach that nature in nature language into that prompt temp, uh, template. So you could refer to our code on GitHub for the details and then the instruction. Instruction is quite common, right? Like to tell the um, what you are trying to do. So for a better transformation of the, the yellow part, because we still run in a predictive mode. So that's why we still need the projection layers. But we believe that you could also try to, to modify this part into a generative mode. So to do that, you will not need the projection anymore. So that will allow the whole thing in a generative manner. So that's also possible. So that's what I, well, uh, what I will do if I'm solving your your problem, yeah. 
Thank you so much. Yeah, and also in the chat, there is another question. I mean, you can check uh, from Yusef. Okay, so you mean the so this question is about uh the baseline comparison. All right, so as you can see, so here because I only screenshot the uh the summarized the results in the in the main text of the paper. So we compared with some related models that I just introduced the GPT for TS and some transformer based methods, right? Like uh patch TST. Uh, fit former, out former, et cetera, stational uh, transformers, uh, EST former, et cetera. So those are deep learning based algorithms. And we haven't compared with the RSTM um, because we just compared the very recent methods, but we could also compare with the RSTM. That's, that's not impossible. And here, I don't know if this can also address your problem that we have compared with some um, uh, statistical or semi uh, or some hybrid methods like the n keys and n beats, so that's more close to the traditional things. So I don't know if this addresses your question, and you could also refer to our paper anyway. So yeah, it's okay, you Yeah, okay. Another yeah. question. Yeah, it's okay. I okay. I think it's a last question in the chat because time now it's more than one hour. So. Yes. Yeah, last question. So, and see. Yeah, I say yes, exactly. So this question, I think, is, uh, is, is somewhat overlapped with Dr. Yu's question. So in short, yes, but you need to do some modifications, right? Like uh, uh, as I mentioned, um, Time LLM is native for forecasting, but if you want to do the classification, you at least need to modify, sorry, you at least need to modify the output projection parts as well as the optimization uh, problems here. But I believe it's possible, yes, in short. So uh, I have a question about this part. So if uh, if he, he or she use uh, uh, E, E.g. for classification, does it need to do the labeling for the E.g. data with the text? Vizy? I believe. Should I be. believe yes. Okay. The labeling, right? Yes. Uh, could you give you some example, like uh, what kind of text uh, description should the game? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So. Uh... Let me jump to this part, the prompt. Okay, so for the uh for the EEG or ECG diagonals, so the first part, like, I mean, in the in, in the prompting part, right? Because for the model architecture, as I mentioned, you need to do some modifications, right? And for the prompting, the domain knowledge could be some the patient related things, right? Because your diagonals should should in the context of the patient situation. So it could be some something like uh, the historical diagonals, like what's the patient situations that could be your domain information here. And your instruction, of course, here could be like to classify the the given EEGs to like you need to you need to be specific to simplify the whole things like to predict whether the, the EEG is for example, yes, yes, represents the the units, and no, not belong to that unit. So that could be the case for most of the situations. And of course, you could also use the in context learning things like to give an examples, but that's more related to a kind of uh, agent like system. So that's another level of things. But for the time hour, uh, that's the things you can simply. That, that that's the modifi modifications you can simply to do and to optimize the time on to 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 change that from forecasting for the classification so technically i think that's possible yeah yeah so you said here uh it's it's about the whole the whole task uh, text description uh, uh 
is it possible to give as uh, for each time series give them the tactic uh, description like uh, some research on post language they give the the post time series they say okay this is jumping this is jogging like this for each uh, each one well um that it have i have. yes so i would not see very absolute words but what i can tell is you can treat this part actually as the strong multimodal time series pattern machine mm -hmm. okay yeah. so the means that given a specific for example eeg data together with the with the prompter like this you are expected to represent a very informative representation like this green part but what you are trying to use that part for what specific time that really depends on you. Like you want to do classification. Okay, like um, let's do classification by using, for example, let's implement a very simple projection to see how it works. So that's what I can tell at this stage.